We then also have Dr. Kalinda Linda, who's a clinical psychologist, a cognitive behavioral therapy expert, as well as the current SADAG board chairperson. She's done many talks, workshops, written books, done lots of press and media around the topic of panic. So we know that this is definitely a passion subject for her, and she'll be teaching us a lot of practical tips and tools this evening. Hi, everyone. And um, absolutely, I agree with France. This is such a privilege to be involved with something like this. And often people think I'm crazy when I say that panic is my favorite thing in the world, but you'll find out why uh, by the end of the next 10 minutes. So I'm just going to share my screen. Just bear with me. It takes me time to get the slideshow going. There we go. Okay, is it clear? Good. All right, so, so I've really just got a few slides here and France has given a wonderful explanation of what panic is and the processes and especially the, the biological side and then the biological treatments. And I absolutely echo that that you do need to have the combination because if somebody's got such terrible panic that they're not reachable, you know, I can do as much CBT as I like, I can do what I want, but it's not going to stick. So um, the role of medication is incredibly important to make somebody contained enough and comfortable enough that they can absorb the CBT techniques. And then later on, when they go off the meds, they tend not to relapse. So I know not everybody can take meds, and then sometimes we, we have to use the CBT just like that. It takes a bit longer, can be done, but definitely if you can get the best of both, that's always first prize. So I've called this from avoidance to antidotes, and I think that's gonna become quite clear as we go. So let's begin. So if we think about how panic works, this is the CBT model of panic. So it's a catastrophic misinterpretation of physical sensations. So what on earth am I talking about? So as Dr. Korb was saying, the symptoms appear to come out of the blue. You just doing something, driving in a meeting in the shop and suddenly you get these symptoms. Now that is one of the ways in which we diagnose, but actually what's happening is there's the biological genetic underpinning. So there's a vulnerability for certain brains. And then there is life and events and it can even be good stress. It can be getting a promotion, having a baby, meeting someone. All of those things can actually gradually push up your baseline level of adrenaline. Let's say it like that. And it's very gradual. And one fine day, there's a random critical event. And it kicks you over the edge. So a lot of people actually have it when they've got a hangover. And the next morning, they're driving to work. And they, they're feeling awful. And they have a blood sugar low. Or maybe they're driving along and they're half fall asleep and then they wake up abruptly and just that last little bit of adrenaline kicks you over the edge. So let me do this for you visually. So think about when you've been scratchy and ratty and then just one thing kicks you over the edge and you have an argument. It's like that, that you suddenly at that next level. And so you have all those ghastly physical symptoms that France mentioned. So there'll be things your heart will be pounding, you can't breathe choking, stomach is really sore, there, there's this peristaltic um, feeling in the stomach, the void reflex, um, you feel out of your body, you don't know where you are, you're shaking, you can't feel your face, your arms, your legs. So I, I'm sure everybody watching knows exactly what I'm talking about. Now, if I told you you were going to have that sensation in five minutes time, it would be horrendous. But if you weren't expecting it, you didn't see it coming, what are you going to be thinking? You're going to be thinking, this is a threat. This is very, very dangerous. And when you think something is a threat, this activates fight or flight, you get more physical sensations. So you're seeing this vicious cycle. Physical sensation, uh-oh, it release adrenaline, another burst, uh-oh, and this vicious cycle continues like this. And this can go on for hours. So in fact, that these are short, they're around two to four minutes each attack, but there are a whole lot of them going, going, going. And because your, your brain is under attack, it's not thinking properly. So you're in this horrendous situation. And when it eventually stops, which might be you fall asleep or you go to casualty, or um, maybe you, you exhaust it in some shape or form, maybe you walked it out, whatever it is, Usually you have to go to casualty and they give you meds and then that usually blocks it. So after the event, you're at your house, 
you've had this horrendous experience, you might not know what it is, and what are you doing? You start to think. That thing was so awful. I can never have that again. I have to do everything in my power to avoid that situation. And then just thinking about the situation, because you blame the situation. You don't know about the cycle here. So just thinking about the situation, you see the cycle already starts you feeling, uh-oh, uh-oh. So you're sitting in your house thinking about the situation. Things that feel threatening release the fight or flight system. Uh-oh, physical sensations. Now you're sitting in your house and you've got these physical sensations. Now you're really scared because I'm just sitting here. I'm not even on the road or in the shop and I'm starting to feel like this. I can't even think about going there again. And this is really how agoraphobia happens from the, the cognitive side. So the problem is actually in your thoughts, but that's not enough. So that's the cognitive part of CBT, cognitive behavior therapy, but we need the behavioral part as well, which is the other two, the physical and the situation. So how do we fix this? Let me just complete this. So from a CBT perspective, this is what, what we, how we conceptualize panic. So it starts off with this vicious cycle, the physical thoughts, then we blame the situation, and then we have the fear of fear cycle. We, we, we're so scared that we'll have that feeling happen again that we rather just don't go there. And if it happened in that shop, it could happen in another shop and maybe in a meeting and maybe in the movies. So you see how that expands. Now, this is all happening in the primitive brain, which is very black or white thinking. So if something looks like it might be a threat, it'll just put it on the threat list. So the best way to look at this is to think about if today, let's say a Rottweiler bites you and maybe next week, you go to your friend and they've got a Rottweiler. It's very well trained. You know it very well that that maybe looks similar to the one that bit you last week. So I'm just going to avoid that one in case. And then maybe I just stop going to my friend and I just rather see them out at my other friend who doesn't have a dog. And then maybe I'm in the park and there's a poodle, but it still looks kind of like the Rottweiler. So maybe it will become vicious and bite me. So you can see how this generalization happens. And that's what happens with agoraphobia. We just start to avoid anything that could be a potential trigger situation. And of course, this can, as Dr. Corp said, this can happen in the context of social anxiety, where the situation is more the emphasis than the physical sensations. So there you're thinking about the performance in the situation. It can also happen with OCD, when you're prevented from doing your ritual, but it's not so much the emphasis on the physical, it's more the discomfort because you can't do the ritual. It can happen with PTSD, where your thoughts are very much about the situation and what happened. So with all of those, the emphasis is on the thoughts and the situation. Where with panic, it's more equally on the situation I want to avoid, I don't want it, and the physical sensations, which I cannot survive. So we definitely have to treat both. So let me quickly cover that. So how do we do this? So step one is psychoeducation. So when somebody comes for a session, the first session is where you take a proper history, you check that none of the medical things that were listed are a problem, and you then make sure that this really is panic. And then what you do is you would explain everything I'm explaining to you now, unique to the person. So this is where your attack happened. This was the context you were in. This is what was going on in your life six months before. So, and we explain in more detail that this is exactly what happened. And we go into even more detail on what is actually happening in the brain when you have a panic attack. So that cycle that I showed you, we unpack that in much more detail because knowledge is power. Even if it's a horrible situation, at least if you have some indication, you're feeling a little bit better, a little bit more in control and you know this is a thing, it has a name, and we also know how to fix it. And that's one of the, the wonderful things about CBT, is that since the 60s, we've been actually researching CBT, panic, how do we fix it, how do we refine the techniques, and they work. And this is my 30th, well, it's almost my 30th year of practice, which seems a bit crazy, but I know that it works because I've seen it work over almost 30 years. And it works every single time without fail. Even if somebody's had panic for decades, it doesn't matter. 
it works every single time. And I definitely wouldn't still be doing these techniques if they didn't work. So I promise you they work. So that's the psychoeducation part. Then the next part, what on earth is interoceptive deconditioning? Well, remember those three blocks I showed you? The physical symptoms and then the thoughts about them and the vicious cycle. The first panic attack conditions those two together so that any, any sensation that could be remotely like that, and that can happen so often, walking upstairs, exercising, getting excited, having a coffee. So any sensation that is similar to that, remember the Rottweiler example? Any sensation that is similar to that has now become conditioned. Uh oh, that's a threat. So we do a set of exercises where basically you desensitize yourself to the physical symptoms. And it's kind of tricky to explain that. And, and it's beyond the scope of this evening. But CBT therapists do know how to do this, or some of us do. So basically, we're breaking that link between the physical symptoms and the thoughts of threat. And um, this is very, very powerful because from then onwards, you've deconditioned. And then it's really a mopping up in terms of all those situations that have been avoided. And so then we get to the agoraphobia and the avoidance. And we would have graded exposure with a hierarchy. And we would sometimes use phobic aids. We might use um, psychology students or we might use maybe family, you know, if they trust somebody. Say if it's driving, somebody gets trained on how to do it. And then initially they would have safety cues, maybe the Ativan, maybe the cell phone. And then after a while, we would step it up and we would take away those safety cues. But the whole thing with CBT is that it's 100% collaborative. In fact, we call it collaborative empiricism, getting you all these words this evening. So collaborative, as in we work completely as a team. No one's pushed beyond where they're comfortable. They're never pushed without an explanation of why we're doing what we do. And there's a collaboration all the way through, very, very closely. And, and then um, the empiricism is that all of CBT is based in research. So we know what works, we know why, and we know how. And we share that with you so that you don't need us. And so that is why panic, if it's uncomplicated, can be resolved in about four sessions. Or maybe that's just me because I love panic. And it can definitely be resolved if it's been relatively short term and there's no comorbidity with generalized anxiety or depression or substances. And um, if it's a situation like that, it might take about 12 sessions, but it definitely can be resolved in weeks as opposed to months or years. So please, please find somebody who does CBT. And so here's some first aid for panic, and then I'll talk a bit about mindfulness, and then we'll do some Q&A at the end. Now, please remember, during a panic attack, the person may not be receptive for this. So you can print this out, and you can remind them, um, but during the panic attack, they may or may not be thinking properly and be receptive. So this is better for beforehand, but you can try it during. So the feeling is real, but the alarm is false. So what do I mean? So if I said to you, I'm terribly sorry, but the people at my house need to set off the alarm in about a minute, and I'm terribly sorry it has to happen now. So say the alarm duly went off, we'd all leap, including me. You'd have the dogs barking, everybody would freak out, and then we would calm down. And so the feeling would be real, but the alarm would be false. So this is very important, that the feeling, you cannot say to somebody, oh, don't be silly, snap out of it. The feeling is real. And for those two to four minutes that that attack is going on, it is real. So it's a false alarm, but it's real. And panic is, you know, panic, fight or flight and your survival instinct are actually synonyms for one reflex. So this is your survival instinct that's been accidentally triggered. It's not small. It's the biggest one you have. And so that feeling is big. And now having said that, that, that the cycle that I showed you of the physical and the thoughts it's a real activation, false alarm, but the feeling is real. But if you can distract the person for a few minutes, it is a quick fix and it is an avoidance, but this is a quick thing that you can do. If you can try and distract that person for a few minutes, they can hopefully, that, that cycle will stop happening. And if you can quickly distract them as it begins, and with breathing, with anything, anything at all, tell them a joke distract them in some shape or form, get them to count, do any kind of distraction. 
you actually are probably going to block that cycle very quickly. So that's why distraction does work. And please remember, panic, fight or flight survival instinct, same thing. If your survival instinct could kill you, that would be quite a, a grave design error. So sometimes it just helps to reassure the person. You feel like you're going to die, but this is your survival instinct accidentally triggered. It cannot kill you. You will feel like you're going to die. You really do. But it cannot kill you. Okay. Then slowing it down refers to when somebody is really panicking and they phone you or you're with them. Try and get them moving if you can because it helps get rid of it quicker. But slow everything down. Keep your voice very calm. I'm with you. I'm here. This is a panic attack. You've got through these before. I know it's terrible. You'll get through this again. I'm here. And you just keep it very gentle and you slow everything down because they're going to be on five times faster speed. So you just keep it very, very calm. And you can think of panic as the pot boiling over. So a panic attack, think about it like this. If you went into the kitchen and the pot was too hot and it was hot and the lid was bubbling and it was making noises and things. And you kind of got used to that. And then at some point, it got to that critical mass and the pot boiled over with the steam and liquid and all the rest of it. It would be spectacular, but actually as it's boiling over, it's releasing the pressure. So what's ironic is that the panic attack is the pot boiling over and you're actually gonna feel better after that for quite a while until of course the next one builds. But it's just the pot boiling over. It's an accidental trigger of your survival instinct. It's not gonna kill you. And then you can try the distraction and the slowing it down. So these are really just a few first aids that you can use. And then the big question around mindfulness, a lot of questions. So when mindfulness is used incorrectly, it makes it worse. If you're in a panic attack and you haven't done CBT and you're still very scared of those symptoms, why on earth would you want to be completely present in that moment? So please do not use mindfulness like that. Mindfulness works much better when you use it um, in between panic attacks. And so you gradually build up a tolerance for that feeling. And the anticipatory anxiety is real. So this is where mindfulness is far better. We, especially if you've got generalized anxiety as well, but even if you don't and you feel the panic building before you've got to leave the house, say, that is where mindfulness to tolerate that very uncomfortable feeling of anticipation is absolutely at its best. And the one that I like the most is a technique called the clouds are not the sky. And I'm sure we can talk about that a bit later, but it's basically, you can look it up. I think they call one version of this, the big sky meditation. And there's one on my Thoughts First website. So basically, the clouds are not the sky means that you want to get in touch with that big, calm feeling, which is your mind. And then you learn to watch thoughts and feelings, and you just watch without getting involved. And that, that's really, in a nutshell, how mindfulness works. But more on that a bit later.